Hey, Bubba. Hey, Leroy. How you doing? All right, all right. What are you working on? Well, just trying to get this whole mower going. Hmm. I want to ask you a question. Yeah. Have you got your money from the government yet? You know, that $1,400 they said they going to send everybody? Yeah, I got it. I, I threw it on the floor to be sure it wouldn't bounce. <laughs> <laughs> well, what are you going to do with it? Well, I, uh, Leroy, I don't need anything. Does that mean you're going to Save it? You gonna put it in the bank or you gonna stick it under the mattress? Well, <clears throat> no, nah, I've been thinking about that, Leroy, and you know, I ain't missed my social security check one month, just like somebody that's been working full time ain't missed a paycheck during all this pandemic mess, so I thought maybe I'd give it to somebody whose income had been affected by this COVID mess. You know that's Tell me, Bubba, who is that? Who is that? My church. Your church. Your church. Your church. That's a good idea. That's a godly idea. That is a godly idea. Well, I wonder where we get those godly ideas from. Tonight, as we uh, uh, have journeyed through uh, Easter, the resurrection, um, the road to Emmaus, the revealing of the post-resurrection of Jesus, there's one more stop along the way that I want us to make. And that is Pentecost. Um, the day the Holy Spirit came and filled the room, but more than that, filled the hearts of man for the very first time. So we want to go to the scripture tonight and, and look at Acts chapter 2, and uh, we want to look into what took place that very day in um, time when uh, the Holy Spirit of God, the fulfillment of the promise of Jesus came upon man, but just didn't come upon them, but came to dwell in them. And what does that mean for us and all of that? So we're going to look at some things to uh, tonight as we consider the day the Holy Spirit came. So if you've got your Bibles with you, I want you to turn to Acts chapter 2. And uh, we're going to read the first 21 verses tonight simply because it tells the story um, of the coming of the Holy Spirit and what that meant to the, to the disciples there um, and what it should mean to us as well. So if you got your Bibles, go ahead and get them out, Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. If not, it's going to be there on the screen for you to follow along with me. So let's read together Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as fire, and it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and they were confused because every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein uh, we were born? Parthasians, Medes, and uh, Elathamites, uh, they're dwellers of Mesopotamia and Judea and uh, Cappadocia and uh, Pontus and Asia and Pygeria and Pamphylia and Egypt and parts of Libya uh, and, and Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes. Greeks and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongue and the wonderful work of God. And they were all amazed and, and were in, in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? 
Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as you suppose, seeing that it is but the third hour of the day. But this is uh, that which was spoke, spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will uh, show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapors of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the coming of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the fact that it is the fulfillment of the promise of Jesus not to leave his disciples without uh, the presence of God with them. Lord, all the, the, the days of their training, those three, three and a half years that they spent with Jesus, he was there with them and, and, and the times that he was absent from them, their, their spirit was troubled. But now, O oh Lord, uh, you have gone back to your throne in heaven, but yet you have given to us the Holy Spirit of God so that we may never, ever be alone. Thank you that the Holy Spirit not only dwells among us, but dwells in us so that wherever we go, he goes with us. Lord, tonight as we look at the, the, the important meanings behind the Pentecost and, and, and what we're to learn, we pray that you would uh, allow the Holy Spirit who is uh, given the, the role of teaching us the things of Scripture so that we might have fuller understanding. May the Holy Spirit that dwells in us speak to us and, and share with us the meanings that we need to see and the reasons that we need to see so that we might know the great gift that God has given to everyone who believes. Lord, thank you for the purpose of uh, uh, Pentecost. Thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit. Now we pray your Holy Spirit to lead God and direct us as we study God's Word together. In Jesus name. All right, when the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles and the other believers on that day called Pentecost, those who heard them speaking in tongues or different languages, were perplexed and asked the question, what does this mean? That question persists even in our day today when it comes to understanding the Holy Spirit and what He does in our life. What does it mean? No study of the person of the Holy Spirit would be complete without considering the events in the opening verses of Acts chapter 2. This is a great chapter. It's filled with great history for it describes the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon God's people for all generations. It is a great inspiration, for when we read it, uh, as we read it over and over again, the wonder of it all grips our heart and begins to give us the, the, the encouragement and inspiration that we are not in this alone, but God has come to dwell among us and with us so that we, He will always walk it, through it with us. And then, um, not only that, it, it also is great from the point of view of instruction. When we look at this, we, we find that there is much that we can learn about the Holy Spirit, the working of the Spirit, and the purpose behind the Spirit, and what God has given Him to us to accomplish in this world. The earthly ministry of Jesus is, is ended when he ascended up into the heavens, when they watched him that faithful day uh, speak his last words to them here on earth, and then the Bible says that, that he ascended up into the clouds, his earthly ministry had ended in, in, in the Gospel of John. And then in the, in the letter of Acts, in the recording of the Acts of the Apostle in chapter 2, it is the opening... Uh, of the, the, the Holy Spirit by the descending of God 
uh, through the Holy Spirit. So we have, a, we have an ascending and a descending of God so that as Jesus goes up, the Holy Spirit comes down. They are never left without the, the aid and the help and the support of, of God himself. We know that the Holy Spirit was very active before Pentecost and that he indwelt, filled, and empowered the Lord Jesus Christ through his earthly ministry. But up until then, he had never come to dwell within believers. He just dwelt among believers, upon believers. Now, on the day of Pentecost, we see that the Holy Spirit comes and he takes up residency in our hearts and in our lives. He come to do just that, to uh, be the fulfillment of the promise of Jesus in John chapter 14, verse 16, when Jesus said, I will pray to the Father and he will give you another comforter, a paraclete, uh, that will, will abide with you forever. So, there's a few questions that we want to ask tonight uh, as we look at this. The first question starts with what prompted Pentecost? What caused Pentecost to happen? Well, first of all, uh, we see that it was God's timing. Uh, Acts chapter 2 verse 1 says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come. Now that term, fully come, we see that in several ways through Scripture. Um, and, and in the fullness of time, the Lord, God sent his son to be born into the world. We see that um, God has appointed times for things to happen in history. And God always is right on time. And so in Acts chapter 2, it says, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, meaning the time for it to happen, it happened. Now, the thing that we need to remember is the day of Pentecost did not come because of any human conditions that were met as part of the disciples. It wasn't what they did. It was what God had planned to happen. Pentecost was predetermined in the time, uh, in the mind of God. In his sovereign will, the date of the coming of the Holy Spirit had been fixed to take place at a certain point in history. Now, what was that point? Well, when we go back to the Old Testament, in the book of Leviticus, in chapter 23, we find that there is, in verses 11 through 16, we don't have time tonight to go back and read all that, but I would encourage you, go back and read if, uh, Leviticus chapter 23, verses 11 through 16, where you will, you will find that uh, we hear that there is an event that's taking place uh, here, and, and it has to do and tie together with uh, Passover and uh, a time period of an offering after that. And so um, the date and coming of the Holy Spirit being fixed as a 50 days after the Passover. And, and so in Luke or Levit Leviticus chapter 23, um, he could not, the Holy Spirit could not have come before the 50th day, no matter what preparations of heart might have been taken place and uh, for those who were waiting for his coming, because of Leviticus sets a particular time that God had set that this would happen. He came in accordance with Israel's ecclesiastical calendar. It is true in, uh, it is a true in, in, in um, his experience that there were uh, conditions that needed to be met that we would know the, the conscious presence of the Holy Spirit within our life and service. But it is also true that the day of Pentecost had fully come according to Acts chapter 2 in verse 1. Now, what I mean by that is the Holy Spirit does not indwell non-believers. So there's some things that we have to do. We have to become a believer in order for us to open up our hearts so that the Holy Spirit of God can move in. But the Holy Spirit of God came to dwell in man on the day of Pentecost, in, according to Acts chapter 2, verse 1. So it was God's timing, and it is God's timing when we come to know him that the Spirit of God dwells within us. But it is also God's positioning. 
Now notice what happens that, that night or day, um, it, you know, when the Holy Spirit comes to these folks. And again, Acts chapter 2, verse 1 goes on to say, and they, meaning the, the followers of Christ, were all with one accord in one place. Remember, Jesus had instructed his disciples that after his resurrection, they were go, to go back to Jerusalem, they were to stay together, and then they would receive the fullness of the promise of God, meaning the Holy Spirit. Now, as we look at that, as the great day uh, on God's calendar came about, the disciples found themselves all together in one place. So God had positioned them to do something for the entirety of the group. Now, if we back up to Acts chapter 1 and verse 15, it tells us, that there were about 120 followers of Christ that had grouped together and were hanging together and, 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 and praying together and worshiping together so that they were constantly together. So we would assume that here in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, that these 120 were gathered in this upper room and they were uh, spending time together when Acts chapter 2, verse 2 takes place. So, and in and, and Acts chapter 2, and verse 2, what does it say to us? He tells us that, and suddenly there came, suddenly there came, all right? Uh, as they were worshiping the Lord uh, and praying together, they were sitting there together as they were meeting together. Remember, it is not the position of the body that counts. Rather, we're sitting, standing, kneeling uh, on our face. It is not the position of our body that, that invites the Spirit of God in. It is the position of our heart. And their hearts were such that they were ready to receive promise of God. See, God not only uh, had an appointed time, but he had a appointed position. He brought them together in an act of worship where they would be prepared for the coming of the Holy Spirit. So um, when we look together at what question we have, first of all, that first question is what prompted the Holy, or the Holy Spirit to come? What prompted Pente Pentecost? It was God's timing, the, the uh, Jewish calendar that, that set 50 days or what we call Pentecost. It, it's another feast that God had set about and the positioning that God did with his people. The second question that comes to mind is what are the manifestations of Pentecost? You see, not only what prompted Pentecost and we see what prompted it, but what are the manifestations of Pentecost? The coming of the Holy Spirit was accomplished by striking manifestations of his presence and his power. Now, Acts chapter 2 and verses 2 and 3 remind us of this. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the, all the house where they were sitting, meaning where they were gathered together. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it set upon each of them. Now, there are three things that I want us to see here. First of all, the first thing is suddenly. Suddenly. Have you ever searched the scripture to note the things that God has done suddenly? It's interesting to see uh, how God oftentimes moves. There are times when God is meticulous and, 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 and uh, methodical. And, and that it, we see that, okay, the next step is evidently that God's going to show up. But there are times when, boom, all of a sudden God shows up. For example, the flood. You see, the Bible tells us that in uh, the days of Noah, the people were going on, even though Noah was building the boat and everything was getting ready and the people were laughing and joking and carrying on and they were living life. And then all of a sudden, the earth began to flood. All right, so we see a sudden sea in the flood. How about the destruction of Sodom? Uh, the destruction of Sodom is another one of those times when, when God just all of a sudden releases his wrath upon Sodom and Gomorrah. The incarnation, all right? The conversion process takes place suddenly, as it did with Zacharias uh, in Luke and Saul in, in, in uh, Tarsus and, and the jailer in Acts chapter 16. Now, 
in contrast to God's sudden work of salvation, we need to be reminded that God forms the, 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 the character of his people very slowly. Philippians 1.6 reminds us that what God starts in us, that he will continue to keep working in our lives until he returns or until we go home. You see, salvation is instantaneous. Sanctification is a lifelong process in which God does. You see, we, we're suddenly saved because we have come to uh, accept the, the salvation that God freely gives to all who will believe. And then from that point on, the Holy Spirit comes in and he does, not only does he do a work of salvation, but then he begins a work of process of sanctifying our life, changing our lives from uh, our sinful character and nature into a Christ-like character and nature. And when God begins that work, he doesn't complete it or doesn't stop doing it until he comes back or until we go home. So we see suddenly. And then second of all about Pentecost, the, the, the second thing that we see about this manifestation was that it came audibly. All right. So we are told that, that there was a sound, a noise that came from heaven. And it filled the whole house. Now, we don't know. There, there are different kinds of noises and sounds. You know, have you ever heard one of them high-pitched sounds that, you know, just causes you to cover your ears and, 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 and just shriek because it hurts so much? Um, there are uh, noises that just startle us. Um, you know, we're really not told what the sound was, but it, 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 it was like a mighty rushing wind. Now, we've heard that roar of the mighty rushing wind uh, come up and over our mountains here in, in, in West Jefferson. I live on the bottom of, of Mount Jefferson, and oftentimes as the wind comes up and over Mount Jefferson in our little valley there on Oakwood Road, we hear a roar uh, oftentimes, and it sounds like a freight train coming through. And, and we know that it's simply the wind uh, allowing us to know that it's blowing, and it gives us that audible sound. So... Um, so we see that there is a noise, a sound that comes from heaven and fills the whole house. How often, on the other hand, God works in silent, almost undetectable. Consider the words of John chapter 3 and verse 8 when it says, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou may heareth the sound thereof, but cannot tell whence it comes and whither it goes. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Even though there is a sound of the wind, we don't know which direction the wind's coming from. We don't know. God moves in such a way that even though they heard an audible sound, they didn't know from whence God was coming. It was almost undetectable about which direction God was coming from. But then there was the sudden, and there was the audible, but then there was the visible. You see, the third part of this manifestation in these verses was that um, there appeared to be unto them cloven tongues like of fire that set upon each one of them. They saw what seemed to be what we call tongues of fire. Right? Just as the Holy Spirit was seen by John the Baptist to come on the Lord Jesus like a dove in Matthew chapter 3, so he came upon these believers, not like a dove, the symbol of purity, but like a flame of fire, symbol of cleansing and purification. You know, every time that I uh, read this or study this, I am drawn back to that occasion uh, in Isaiah, when Isaiah is taken before the throne of God and all of that magnificence happens and, and Isaiah recognizes as he is taken before the throne of God, he says, woe is me for I'm a man of unclean lips and I, I dwell among a people of unclean lips. And you remember the, the Bible tells us there in Isaiah that, that an angel took a coal from the, 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 the altar fire and, and, and he touched his lips purifying his lips with fire, that purification process. 
You see, the Bible tells us here that the evidence of the work of the manifestation of the Holy Spirit is that when He moves in, He purifies us from all of our old sins and all of our old behaviors and all of that. The wind and the fire are symbols of the work that He has come to do in each and every one of us. When Pentecost comes, there is a breeze that blows away the debris and there is a blaze that, that, that cleanses and, and, and purifies uh, the, the house in which he lives. Oh, I'm so thankful that when the Holy Spirit of God came in me, he didn't leave me the same. When the Holy Spirit of God moves into your heart and your life, he cannot leave you the same. Listen, my friends, if you, if you or anyone else says that, oh, I've accepted Jesus and the Holy Spirit of God is living in my life, but, but nothing has changed, you're being fooled. and You need to look seriously at your conversion and the, the, the who dwells within your heart and in your life. You see, for the Holy Spirit of God cannot leave us the way that he we, he found us because we were unpure. We were full of debris and, and, and sin, and he must clean it out. He has to have a holy place to dwell. So Pentecost comes there to, as a breeze and a blaze. So the third question tonight, the final question, is what are the results of Pentecost? Now, I want us to look at what are the results of Pentecost in the life of the, the disciples here in the first century? And then what are the results of Pentecost today, 20-some centuries later, as we look at the 21st century? What are we doing with the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives? So first of all, uh, what are the results of the Pentecost? The filling of power. The power of God come upon them and filled them. And listen to what Acts chapter 2 verse 4 says. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, I know there's a lot of confusion about this and I, I thought rather or not that I should talk about uh, the speaking in tongues and languages, but that's not really what we're here to talk about tonight. We're here to talk about the power of God. The, the important thing is what actually happened. However, that um, is found in the statement, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the important thing, that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. The effects of being filled with the Holy Spirit are, are many, and we don't have time tonight to talk about all of the effects of, of being filled with the Holy Spirit. The question is, do we allow the Holy Spirit to fill up our life? I believe some people try to keep some areas of their life. We try, to, we try to keep a reservoir of ourselves so that we only allow the Holy Spirit so much residence in our life. All right? So let's look at what this means and, and, and talk about it for just a few moments. They, uh, they would not understand what, it, what was happening to them that night, nor could they explain uh, the, the, the philosophy of it. But they knew something happened. They knew that their life was different. They knew that the Holy Spirit had come, that God had kept His promise, that He had showed up. So let's, let us always remember that it is not about how much intellectual knowledge and, and, and understanding that we have and how that we can explain what God is doing. Listen, my friends, if you can explain God away, then He's not much of a God. Reality is that God is far beyond our explanation. Now, what we need is not an intellectual knowledge of God. We need a spiritual experience of God. It's not about knowing Him. You see, remember the, the road to Emmaus, the, the, the disciples that they knew of God, they had heard about God, they'd even seen Him die on the cross, they knew of Him 
but they had not come to know him yet. They had intellectual knowledge and understanding of God, but they had not yet retained a spiritual understanding. And Jesus took them through the scripture and explained to them who he was. And then he revealed himself as the risen Savior. And then their eyes, their spiritual eyes were opened and they experienced him spiritually as well as intellectually. And that's what took place that night or that day in, in, in the upper room when the company of 120 different men and women all together in one accord, meaning that they were worshiping together, they were praying together, they were, they were in the Lord together. And they were told that they were all, not some, but all were filled with the Holy Spirit. We should be careful in, ca in, in case the language used of the Holy Spirit in verse 4 leads us to think of Him as just a mere power or influence. We need not to recognize or to think that, that, okay, the Holy Spirit is a power that comes into our life. He's a force that moves us. Yes, He is, but that is, that is not what we want to understand Him as. All right, um, we need to be careful how we look at him. Um, he is more than a force. Look at the word filled. It brings about a mental picture of fluid, energy, breath, force. But as we have seen in previous studies of the Holy Spirit, as we have looked, the Holy Spirit is a person. And what person is he? He's the third person of the Trinity. So we need to recognize that the reason that he was this force in their life, the reason that he had such power, dynamite, as, as that word power means, explosive ability, is because he is God himself. He is the third person of the Godhead Trinity. And to be filled with him means that he has the ability to, be, uh, to possess us, to control us, to dominate us. It is possible, however or someone to be filled with Satan and not filled with God. Acts chapter 5 and verse 3 tells us a story. Now this is after Pentecost now, remember. And these are, these are believers who should be receiving the Holy Spirit. But Peter, you know, encounters Ananias. You remember Ananias and Sapphira? They, they were the ones that sold their possession, but yet held back a portion, but told uh, the, the church, the leaders, that they had given all to the Lord. Here's what Peter says to Ananias. Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back a part of the price of the Lamb? Notice what it says. Why has the Satan filled your heart? Why have you given room to Satan in your heart? See, we can, we can push back the Holy Spirit and, and, and allow Satan to have possession in us. But God's plan is never for Satan to have any place in us. But that we should be spirit-filled believers all the time. So that our hearts and our minds and our wills are under the, the mastery of the Holy Spirit of God. I, I'm reminded of what the Apostle Paul said in uh, Ephesians chapter 5 when he says, And be not drunk with wine wherein is in excess. See, we're not to allow anything else to control us. But here's what he says, But be filled with the Spirit. You see, Paul reminds us that whenever we allow the things of this world to, to dominate us, we're pushing out the, the effects and the, the work of the Holy Spirit for something else to control. But he said, do not allow those things to control you, but always be filled with the Holy Spirit so there is no room for anything else in our life to control us. Filled with the Holy Spirit does not rob us of our true personality. Oh, that I think that, you know, we need to, to uh, recognize that we need to be praying often, Lord, I need to be less of me and more of thee. Uh, because what is it that God reminds us that the work of the Holy Spirit is to, to give us a Christ-like spirit? 
so that we are less like the sinful hum, human that we are and more like the, 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 the spiritual Christian that we should be. But here's the thing. Peter, even when at the fullest point of his life of the Spirit, was still Peter. Paul, even being filled with the Holy Spirit of God in, and, and used mightily, he was still Paul. Yet the Holy Spirit is the one who dominated in their lives, in the lives of both Peter and Paul, and used them in great ways to do marvelous things for his kingdom's sake. You see, the reality is that I can still be me and still be filled with the Holy Spirit and be used of God in a powerful and mighty way. So the first thing that we understand when we look at that is that we want to be reminded that there is a filling power of the Holy Spirit. But there is also the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. You see, the, the difference being is that He pours all of Himself in us, but the, the indwelling power is that, is that He comes to live with us. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came to apply in our lives of believers all that the Lord Jesus Christ did as He died, rose again, and ascended to heaven to make possible for us to accomplish. You see, the abiding power of the Holy Spirit is that He helps us to live out our everyday lives for not us, but for Him. The Apostle Paul reminds us uh, that I crucify my flesh daily so that it's not I that liveth, but Christ that liveth through me. You see, the Holy Spirit of God comes to abide in us. His abiding power allows us to overcome the desires to live our life our way and to live it His way. What does that really look like? The Lord Jesus came to give the example and the pattern for how you and I should live our Christian lives. He showed us. As a matter of fact, one of the greatest things that we can do to see how that we are to live the Christian life is not to look at Paul or Peter or, or James or John, but is to look at Jesus. Yet, yeah. all too often when we go back and we read the Scripture and we look at Jesus and we say was God, and I'm not. How can I ever, ever accomplish anything even close to that? By recognizing that God gave us the abiding power of the Holy Spirit in our life, so that we have that ability. Now, in, in Acts chapter 2, verses 17 through 21, is, is, is a powerful look at what God intended for the believer to use the Holy Spirit for. Um, and when we look at this, we find that he, he begins to say in those days, he's going to pour out his spirit upon us and we're going to go out and we're going to do these marvelous things for God. But I want us to come to verse 21 and I want us just to focus in on there for just a moment. And it says, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The greatest work the Holy Spirit of God wants to do through us is to share the life of Christ with others who have not come to know Him so they too can come to know Him. He gave us the pattern. He gave us the Holy Spirit to give us the dynamics or, or the power to um, live out the Christian life. Thus, we see that Pentecost was the, the complement, if you would, of Calvary. We have the salvation that comes from Calvary, the, the power that comes from the Holy Spirit of God indwelling us to allow us to live out our lives. For Pentecost made actual in the lives of men and women all that Calvary made possible. Live out our salvation. Apostle Paul says, work out your salvation with Meaning that the Holy Spirit of God has been given to us so that we can work out our salvation. We can, we can live for Christ every day, living out our salvation before others. Without Pentecost, Calvary would never have been effective to a lost and dying world. 
<coughs> yes, Jesus died on Calvary, and we would have been forgiven there, but that's where it would have ended. Without the resurrection, we have the, no promise of everlasting life. Without the pouring out of his spirit upon us, we have no ability to go out and live the Christian life. Thank God for the pouring into our lives the work of the Holy Spirit. Let me remind you again what Paul said. That God who has begun a good work in you will continue that work until the day of completion, until Jesus comes or until he calls you home. So let's close our time and wrap it up. God's purpose at Pentecost was simply to equip the church. Oh, by the way, that's not this building, that's you and I. With the mighty power of the Holy Spirit so that we would be his witnesses to not some people, but to all the nations. So that every tribe, every tongue, every language, every people group would come to know Jesus as Savior resulting in his eternal glory. I want you to ask yourself these questions as you think about the purpose of the of Pentecost in our life today. First of all, is my focus on God's glory in all things? Am I focused on God's glory in all things of my life or just some things? Am I, am, am I giving God a portion of my life or have I surrendered all to Him? Do I even think about Him as I go through my week? Does it even matter if I resist temptation or how I speak to others? Does it really make a difference in my life? Listen, if the Holy Spirit of God is in you as a believer, then he must have control of you all the time, not just some of the time. The second question, is my passion that nations would glorify God through the gospel? Listen, if your heart is not on world missions, if your desire is not to see all that will come to salvation, then listen, my friends, your heart is not in tune with God. You need to ask the Holy Spirit to tune up your heart so that you're in tune with the work of the Holy Spirit and the work of God Himself. Third, is my daily life consistently dependent upon the Holy Spirit? This is the big one. I want you to take it seriously. Would you or I even miss the Holy Spirit if He was withdrawn? question I'm asking is how much of our life are we living in our own strength versus under the power of the Holy Spirit? The reason Christians are so weak and so defeated and so discouraged is we are living in our human strength instead of in the dependence of the power of the Holy Spirit. Friends, I tell you today, Cry out, Holy Spirit, empower me so that I can't do anything. Jesus made a, a statement, and I'll close with this. Jesus made a statement, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Friends, apart from the Holy Spirit, Must learn to depend upon him. Not when we get ourselves in a mess. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. Thank God for Pentecost. Thank him for salvation on the cross, the resurrection of Christ, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit of God, work 